So, good, good morning again. Uh, I'm Peter Brook. I'm uh, the chairman of the World Summit Award. I'm also working with Nora Woloch and the entire team to organize this Young Innovators Festival. And one of the things which we thought we would do at the very beginning of this festival is to connect you all around Europe with those people who are winners, who have done very, very well with their innovations and with their digital new projects. So let me just uh, start and have a very quick personal introduction from each and every one of them. And then we just go into a round of different kinds of conversations. And then I, I know that I will get some briefings of what you have shared as questions in the chat. So first one is uh, Tiana. Tiana, you are in Serbia. Uh, you worked on a project for uh, addressing the climate crisis. Just tell us who you are and what you do very much now. And then we go in the next round into your project. Tiana, please. Thank you, Peter. It's a great honor for me to be here again and to speak on this amazing festival. Uh, I'm Tiana Lezajic, and my organization is Center for Development of Non-Formal Education. And we are doing the project, uh, the name of that project is Forest and Climate. Thank you for joining. And um, the second person is uh, coming from a very far place, from Uganda. Uh, Kona Setile, what are you doing there? And what, what brings you there? Yes, hello everybody. Connor Sadley calling from Kampala, Uganda. I'm working with SEMA, an organization I co-founded here two years ago. We gather citizen voices to improve public services. Look forward to telling you about it. That will be very, very interesting. Then uh, we go to Germany and uh, to a man who does not look so happy this morning. Uh, did you not get any coffee, Christian Erfurt? Uh, you have to uh, put the mic on. Uh, so, sorry that I don't look uh, fresh and well prepared. Uh, that comes with having three small kids who uh, who sleep as they wish to uh, and running a company. But I am pleased to be here today at the festival. Um, thank you for inviting me back. Um, I have the pleasure of, um, of running a, a team uh, named Be My Eyes. We are the world's largest blind organization, helping the world's blind and visually impaired to see, quote unquote, see through the eyes of volunteers and companies that we are partnering with. Um, so very excited to share some of our insights. We will come back to uh, you and to your uh, entire vision and how you set it up as a social innovation. Uh, you saw also that uh, Mrs. van der Leyen, uh, the president of the European Commission, especially singled you and your company and your project out uh, as a good example of social innovation with digital. So how did it make this feel? How, how did you feel about that? I, I was surely smiling a lot more when she mentioned us than when you caught me sitting here uh, taking a power nap. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, very good. Then we have uh, the champion of social media, the one and only um, Mr. Matthias Haas, uh, you are coming from India or from Austria? At the moment in Austria, so um, welcome from my side. So in everything I do, I always believe that we need to take these online tools to create offline impact. And I do that with TEDx, with Super Social and with many projects. And thank you so much for having me. I think uh, what you miss is a little bit of a uh, young innovators, you know, I mean, a word oh, yes. standing beside <laughs> you. You have, you have, there's a lot of white space uh, yeah. to your right. <laughs> uh, we have a, a fifth person in our uh, session, and um, that is Asana Havasli. Uh, but she is at the moment in uh, Syria, in Damascus, and uh, as things turn out there, the electricity went down just uh, before we started, and uh, she tries to connect through phone, but we will see if she can join us. Let's uh, start our conversation, and um, please uh, jump in as much as you want. Uh, but let's start with you, uh, Diana. Uh, in terms of uh, what you have done, just describe it a little bit more, how you use geoinformatics for forest and for sustainability? And how do you grow your project? 
just let's uh, talk about that a little bit. Tiana, please. Yes, thank you. Can I share the screen? You can share the screen, yes. Okay. But not more than three minutes, okay? Okay, no worries. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, I would like to say that we were diving in a very beautiful sea, enjoying And it, is, it was a shark, and its name is COVID-19. And uh, it is even a bigger problem that we now know that there is a bigger shark behind us, that is uh, economic crisis. But just some of us are aware that uh, there is the biggest one behind the second one, and that one is uh, climate change. And actually, my team tried to, to mitigate climate change and to pull back that shark. Uh, and one of the solutions is to planting trees. And adding 1 billion hectares of forest could help us to limit global warming by, uh, by 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius by 2050. So what my team actually do is that we use satellite uh, images and dirt observation data, and we combine all of them uh, to define, to, to find, to identify the perfect location for new forests. So we combine geographical information systems and all those different data to find the perfect location for, for perfect tree species. Uh, here is our site. It is forest and climate site. And if you click on this button, where to plant, you will find maps. Uh, and the greenest part of, of, on the map is the, the, best, uh, the best location for that, that tree species. You can switch the tree species and look for the next species where to plant. Then the second part, if you plant a tree, you can mark the location where you planted uh, your tree. So after our improvement, that tree will appear on our map. So for now, we have the, the, this map only for Serbia, but probably in the future we will do for uh, some bigger region. So this is our roadmap. And yes, last year, European Youth Award, we won European Youth Award, and then we won a World Summit Award. And after that, uh, we got, um, uh, we tried to develop a business model so to be self-sustainable. Uh, and we got a support from Ministry of Environmental Protection. So we did research for three more species and we plant trees in two cities uh, in Serbia. And our business model, at least this is just idea. So to, to give uh, some kind of packages to companies and to organize for them team building activities, which will include plant, uh, uh, tree planting. And then it will definitely have positive environmental impact because those three will capture the, 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 carbon, the carbon emissions. And then from that money, we will try to research and develop a little bit more. So definitely our vision is to support planting one trillion trees to tackle climate change and to find the perfect location for all of those trees. This is a photo from last year in Graz. So this is my team. And this year we are uh, we are stronger because we have two new members and they are forestry experts. And uh, the motto, our motto is uh, plant a tree, made the forest be with you. So that is the, the basically what, uh, what we, we do and how we try to support uh, mitigation of climate change. Thank you very much, Diana. Uh I'm very impressed with what you are doing and what you presented now. I remember the jury uh, in uh, when we looked at uh, for the European uh, Young Innovators Festival last year and also the jury for the World Summit Award. A lot of people said, are they going to make it? But uh, with your presentation, you know, I have a very strong impression that you're not just making it, but that you're just really growing. What is it, what you are doing and how you are setting yourself up in terms of being able to navigate, you know, from a project to becoming a sustainable, let's say, almost a program for impact? Can you just tell us? Yeah, it, it is a huge challenge 
But again, uh, I, I really uh, feel motivated when I try to do something huge. And definitely climate change, I think that is the biggest challenge of this century. And doing and trying to combat that biggest challenge is the, the best motivation for everyone to work and to, to, to try to do the best, to, to work hard. So definitely that, that is my biggest motivation. So doing something that is so, so great. And especially there are many challenges due to COVID-19. So it is hard to plant trees, especially to, to, to invite many people to plant trees in the same time because it is almost forbidden to, to organize that kind of event. But I think uh, this COVID-19 crisis will end up and we will uh, we will uh, soon again be able to plant a lot of trees. I'm sure. Uh, let's just uh, move on. And uh, thank you very much for sharing this with us. Uh, one of the things which you address, but uh, which is much uh, even more central to Connor Settle's work, has been public participation. Public participation in terms of governing structures and uh, governing uh, processes. Uh, and um, I think uh, you had a startup, GovFaces. But what brought you to Uganda, Connor? And uh, what are you doing there now? And how does this link up with the uh, project uh, SEMA? Please uh, just explain that. Sure. Well, thanks a lot for having me. It's really nice to see everybody again. Um, it feels like meeting old friends when I see people like ah. Matthias and Peter again. I was in the wrong room chatting with Adam as well. <laughs> Oops. Um, but very nice to see everybody again. I'll just tell you very briefly what I'm working on now, but I'd, I'd love to talk to you about what happened with uh, my uh, winning solution that won in 2014, the European Youth Awards. Um, right now I'm in Uganda. I've co-founded an organization called SEMA. Um, public services like police, healthcare services, they kind of suck everywhere. Um, uh, doesn't matter if you're in Europe, North America, Africa, Southeast Asia, public services are awful. And so what we do is we include citizens in the people, regular people in the, in the process of making those services better. Um, we've actually measured really good impact. About 80% of offices where we work reduce their waiting times, 70% improve their service quality. We're now uh, the government of the Uganda. Government of Uganda is a client from about three different ministries in, uh, in having us do our work here and improve the way that public services work. Um, what I think is really more important to share is yeah, what happened with the startup that uh, we won the European Youth Award with in 2014. It would be brutal and a bit oversimplified to say that it failed, um, but it is no longer around. Why I say it didn't necessarily fail is because it was such a great learning opportunity to see things that don't work, um, to see things that were not planned the right way or things that we didn't think through in the right way. Um, we learned so much about how to think about a client first approach. We have such a big complex idea about how to change political communication but what we didn't necessarily do was bring a small, lean version to the market and test whether or not um, the value proposition was actually found valuable by users and by people who would pay for it. It sounds so simple, but I think as entrepreneurs, and, and I guess this would be my advice to the winners of uh, World Summit Awards, European Youth Awards, um, and, and really any, any award that awards you for an idea or for an early stage concept, don't ever take that validation in place of the validation of your users, of your clients. Um, that's the number one rule that, uh, that now I carry forward. Everything that we do, everything that my team does here in Uganda, we try the first leanest, smallest version of an idea in the market to see if it works. And in my case here, if it creates impact. And then if it does, then we try the next idea. We try that. We try to scale it up a little bit more. We try to expand it. We see if it works in different contexts. And this very lean approach to entrepreneurship is, I think, what I took away. So that would be my uh, suggestion to entrepreneurs. I know it's hyper basic, but guys and girls, don't ever forget the lean startup concept. If you haven't read the book, The Lean Startup, it's not that great of a book, but it's required reading. Um, read through it, memorize it, know the chapters, and uh, always keep it in mind. That would be that would be my advice. Back to you, Peter. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Connor. Uh, it's uh, different if you read something than if you start living it. No kidding. And I think that uh, that kind of translation is something uh, which you were very nicely expressed. Uh, unless you have a, an attitude that whatever happens can be transformed into a learning. Uh, it's very difficult, you know, not to uh, grow and also in the end to succeed. And I think what I like very much and what you said is, is uh, what uh, Tiana was saying before about uh, forest and climate and her application is she is on a learning journey uh, as much as you are. And I'm very, very impressed with you having now taken your learnings uh, to Uganda and and uh, applying it there for something very concrete like uh, improving services. We'll come back to this in a, in a, in a minute. But let's uh, go and, and look at what uh, Christian Erfurt has been doing, because while, he, while you were addressing the large population and also the majority population and uh, the people, you know, in public, uh, you know, I mean, uh, interactions, he is addressing and what they are doing and their team is addressing a very targeted group of people, a targeted group of people who are often left out and who are not connected. Tristan, tell us a little bit more about uh, your Be My Eyes. Thank you, Peter. I'm just trying to see if I can figure out how to share my screen, but it's not. Uh, it's easy. If you go up to the top right, there's a little uh, uh, I mean, a rectangle and, uh, and an arrow there, and then if you click on it, then you share the screen. Top right. All right. Yeah. Uh, almost. Almost. Okay, it looks like someone else is, is screen sharing already, and it's saying I can't, therefore. But no problem. Okay. I'll take it. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, try now, try now. Uh, okay, now, now again. Um, but I, meanwhile, I can uh, second what Connor said. Uh, the user-driven approach is essential. Like that is day and night for success of, of, a, of a startup. Um, and I would also uh, warmly recommend not only as Connor the Lean Startup, but also a book called The Predotyping approach not prototyping but pre proto uh, pre prototyping uh, by a gentleman called Alberto Savoy and I'm sure we can share the link afterwards there's a YouTube video from Stanford that takes you through it all and I must say that that approach along with lean startup has saved my company multiple times um, in, in in and I think what important Connor shared here was make sure that what you put into the world is also what the world wants from you and expects from you and, and is looking towards. So too many are, are simply looking at it as, it, uh, as, it, as a one-way street. Peter, we won't jump into the slides, no problem. Let me take you through, be my eyes. We are uh, very grateful to be here today. We are 2017 um, uh, winner in the inclusion category. And um, be my eyes is a very simple but powerful concept. Uh, blind and vision impaired people are really good at using their smartphones and tablets by listening to it rather than seeing what's on the screen. Of course, they can't feel any of the buttons, but they can navigate it by audio universe. So if you press messages once, it'll save messages. If you press twice, it'll, it'll open messages. So they Google, they tweet, they're on Facebook, they do everything that Cited are doing. Um, and that's really a basic premises for Be My Eyes, because what we do is that we connect blind and visually impaired people to sighted volunteers when they need visual interpretation. This could be something as simple as uh, preparing a evening dinner and you need to open a can of tomatoes. Uh, but if you end up opening the coconut milk, you're Spaghetti is going to turn out different. And the only way to figure it out is really to open it or ask for someone to step in and have visual eyes on it. So that is a very, of course, a very um, low practical example of what BMIS has been used for. Today, we are in 150 countries. We have more than four and a half million volunteers uh, have joined the platform and a quarter million blind and visually impaired people signing up. 
Uh, we match in 185 dif different languages uh, on an average connecting time of 15 seconds from when they press a button to a volunteer steps in and is, is, is their eyes for um, as little as a couple of minutes or the full hour where they uh, struggle with, uh, with a more challenging task. And, in, and important to say is that um, this has all been done with organic growth. So Matthias, I'm, I'm interested to hear the social media uh, uh, ninja on this panel uh, that we have not spent any money on advertising. We have grown to where we are today, uh, more than 100% year over year, simply by organic growth and the wonderful uh, power of uh, social media. And why is this, if I may wrap it up, Peter, the, the important of this is that we are often reminded of our differences. <clears throat> oh, this is true for the political scene, and uh, if you look at foreign policies and many other places, I think Be My Eyes is a simple example that we are not that different from one another. And we see people helping across cultures, religion, borders, everywhere in the world. And one of my slides is a is a slide to show you how many calls we make per day, and it's all over the world. People are helping uh, everywhere in the world, and they and they don't like we we are not that different. I understand that we fear what we don't understand, but as we start communicating and talking to one another, we will minimize that gap. Finally, um, I can say, be my eyes is now five close six close to six years old. We didn't have a business model for the first three years. It's completely free for the blind, it's completely free for the volunteers, and we decided from day one never to charge the end user. And it was challenging to raise money, build a company, hire people, hire staff. Today we are a total of 18 people and with no business model. But um, it was a principle for us to say there must be a better way than to charge those who need help. Um, and we can't charge those who are offering the help either because it doesn't feel right to take charge them for the good deed that they're doing. So we knew that we could have gone into advertising or um, um, subscriptions, but but that would have opened up for competition. And I can come back to this later. But So there were many reasons not to go into a specific monetization strategy. But at the end of the day, today we have Google, Microsoft, Procter & Gamble, some European banks, uh, Verizon, Twitter, many brands on Be My Eyes, and we charge the companies to have calls from our blind users. So we built critical mass. We went to the companies and said, you don't really know how to communicate with your blind audience, do you? No, we don't. They call on the phone and we can't do anything. All right, let's give you a video feed directly to your customer support center, and we charge them for that. So now you can have, if you need customer support anywhere in the world from Microsoft, you simply press a button and they connect you directly to their customer support team via Be My Eyes. Peter, that was over three minutes. I apologize for that. But but uh, our design sentence has always been, everybody wins only when nobody loses. And I'd like to come back to that later. But I think that's very important for the future of business models that we need to develop. Everybody wins only when nobody loses. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Christian. This is um, very much uh, to the point. I remember again uh, the jury discussion. <laughs> the jury was saying, oh, this is such a simple idea. I mean, how can it work? And the second question was, how, how can it work if digital requires that social needs to be transformed, needs to be innovated. And uh, people, I remember this discussion very well because then some other people said to help somebody else to be empathetic, to, to, to use digital for an instant connection to, to assist somebody, that is not new. <laughs> That's 2,000 years old, 5,000 years old, maybe 50,000 years old for humans, you know? So some people carried the messages and made a religion out of it, but others, you know, I mean, just practice it very much concretely. And that is something, you know, which is so interesting about uh, what you have uh, said and what you are doing. And uh, I realize uh, that uh, I, now uh, we are talking to somebody who is uh, operating a multinational social enterprise. So, I mean, 
uh, welcome to that kind of global world. Uh, and uh, let's see what um, somebody who uses the platforms, which you were just talking about, you know, to really engineer, to empower, and to accelerate social businesses and social enterprise. And there could be nobody better than Matthias Haas. Matthias, tell us a little bit about how you got where you are now and what you are actually specifically doing in terms of social innovation. Matthias, please. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it has been quite a long journey from 2009, first time in contact with the World Summit Youth Award back then, and a Facebook application, which was called Intercultural, where we had a very simple idea as well, with a very simple user face to connect the youth of the world and show them a part what is anyway on Facebook, but show them how, do, how does their dinner look like, how does their bed look like, and how does their way to school look like, to get a better understanding of how youth and how people live across the world, something which we usually don't have easily access to, to look at. And this was very powerful with a lot of users in very short time, but obviously not a very sustainable um, approach because once this platform was filled with a lot of things, it also became, um, yeah, let's say redundant in, in a place. But this was first a great chance to work also with Facebook back then. And I must say this was 2009, Facebook was on the market for two years here in Austria. And, and globally two, three years. So that was a super new approach. Um, when we come a little bit further, I think one of the most important things what I always did, and I said using these online tools to create offline impact, but mostly in a sense of how can we understand each other better and how can we understand the others which they are so nicely portrayed often better. And in 2012 with the European Youth Award, we. We had a project where we did cultural exchanges to India with Austrians and Indians to, to do exchanges, mostly coming from pupils and students from Austria going to citizen journalistic projects to India for one month from north to south for one um, for for doing something we called NGO hopping back then and reporting about all the learnings, um, about the problems which India might have and the solutions which locals found for these problems and report them back to, to <coughs> and see which learnings we can draw from that. And again, um, the social media response was amazing to it. Um, and this was basically just to, a, a step to where we are now. And um, as you said, that the platforms like Findia and Facebook application intercultural might not be there anymore, but I would also never see that as failure because it was rather a development to where we are now, to have a platform where we can showcase incredible ideas which make a pattern change in people who listen to the stories. And with storytelling becoming one of the strongest tools also on social media to change perspective and to change, therefore, behaviors. Um, what I see right now with, with the COVID crisis, uh, I mean, to, to jump long ahead, we have a total education crisis, we have a digital gap crisis, we have a climate crisis, and we have an information crisis as such. Um, with a lot of fake news, I think digital competence is one of the key ingredients what we would need at the moment. And this is something where we have developed to go from um, an intercultural app on Facebook to go to the very basics to say, hey, we need to teach our youth, but not only our youth, we also need to teach our parents and our grandparents how to use these digital tools. And it has never become more important than this year when we celebrate Easter or Christmas, the first time on Zoom with our relatives because we cannot meet them. And it's a digital competence not only to know how to, how to use Microsoft Teams, but it's also digital competence to know which is a credible source and how do I question information I see about everything, not just COVID, but um, it has been just become even more um, present, this topic of digital competence. And what I'm doing now is I still do TEDx events um, online at the moment as we cannot meet. Um, again, with the simple idea that some of these powerful ideas can totally change the perspective of, of people. And there are powerful ideas out there that when you hear them once in a simple TEDx talk, you will for the rest of your life do things differently, a small behavior which makes on a large scale a huge impact. On the second, I run this organization called Popedu, Popular Education, where we teach digital skills and intercultural skills to youth, also in combination with um, not just the elderly, but also with our parents and so on, everybody who wants to gain digital skills um, from, from how to detect fake news, but also how to use Facebook and large. And um, 
with Super Social, I have also the outlet where I do this commercially to help also um, businesses to tell them, hey, how is social media used? How can we work around the algorithm? And how can we produce meaningful, ethical content and not just create more of the same and more noise, but doing storytelling with a purpose and also with ethical and moral guidelines? And yeah, and I think the, the newest thing, which was also very new for me, I saw that um, with all the digital tools, I have a certain bubble I can talk to. You know, a TEDx talk has, a, has an audience which is already eager to learn new ideas. But my question was, how can I reach people who would never by themselves would go to a TEDx event or watch a TEDx talk? Somebody who, when they hear sustainability, already roll their eyes. And how can we reach these people with a new format? And my latest project was I, I worked together with the national television in Austria and we produced a show which is very much on a comedy format and entertainment format with, uh, with a serious background. We call it Dokutainment. And yeah, it just launched in the Austrian TV and we, we are very happy. We had only the first episodes aired, so we will see where that go. So yeah, thank you so much um, for, for having me and so great to see you all. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. I, I realized that uh, Growing means also technologically, I mean, getting uh, not just uh, onto new platforms, but also choosing different kind of media. And I think this kind of intermedia and cross media is something very, very critical. I think that's something which you have done already at the very start, because I think uh, if I remember right, you started with a film and uh, then uh, moved on to digital and uh, now you go into broadcasting. I think that uh, what is uh, what is really interesting here, and uh, that is something which I want to come back to, uh, Tiana, is uh, it is one has uh, different kind of skills, but in order to take the audacity to use them, you know, when you started off with uh, geoinformatics, you know, and with uh, remote sensing and uh, satellite imaging, but now you are actually moving into something, you know, where you need to add new competences, new skills. What role does a community like WSA or the European Young Innovators Festival play in your work? And how, how can you use that community in a good way to enable and to grow what you're doing? Uh, maybe you can focus on that. Tiana, please. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Yeah, uh, this great community support us in turn to, to meet amazing people and to improve our ideas. So that team building um, uh, idea, so to organize team building activities for company is actually idea that we came on uh, last year in Graz. So discussing with uh, different uh, moderators and students and uh, other people. So we conclude, yes, we can connect that and we can make some kind of profit that will uh, lead us to be self-sustainable. So definitely the, the, all those panels, uh, workshops, uh, etc. help us to improve our idea, but definitely amazing people also motivate us to, 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 to be better, to try to improve our idea, to try to improve our model. Uh, and uh, definitely, last year, those moments in the grass were amazing. So the, it, it was last year really, really great uh, festival. So we meet a lot of people, uh, we improve our knowledge, uh, we got new experience. So uh, a lot of benefits from festival, definitely. Do you think, uh, um, I mean, uh, there is about 80, 85, uh, maybe 100 people now uh, in this session, and uh, Nora Wallach just told me that uh, registrations and the chats uh, have been uh, above what we expected. But how do you, uh, I mean, uh, go about making something like an online event like this as sticky as what you said? Because, you know, when you go to a TEDx talk, you're having an evening and then you're excited and then there's this whole issue of how to transfer the enthusiasm or the inspiration from this moment into your everyday life. How did you do it when you came back from Graz to Belgrade and to Novi Sad and to your, uh, to your home country in Serbia? How did you manage this kind of transition? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, it, it was great experience, and we when we came back, 
we, we spread our idea. And what happened in media, it is also interesting. So after we finished our website, uh, after it was online, no one asked us, oh, this is a great idea. Can you share your knowledge? But after we got a word, everyone, national television, newspaper, called us and asked, come to us and explain how did you do that. So definitely that, that is uh, one big benefit that we had after, after last year's festival. So we got uh, some kind of attention from media, which is very useful for all startups and for all projects. And after that, uh, after uh, we go to national television, so some people call us and ask us different questions and tell us that they can help us or that they can support our idea. So definitely that is some kind of a benefit that we had after the festival. That's beautiful. Uh, the more, I mean, uh, that is for the radiation, like, I mean, what Matthias said before in terms of getting onto different kind of platforms. Uh, I think, Matthias, you made this very point uh, in terms of you being almost already a producer in order to connect to people. You know, that is something which is quite important. Uh, however, it is also important uh, to feed back into the network. And uh, uh, Connor, you you were uh, you are just uh, for me somebody who is actually a networking hero within the World Summit Award because you have been moving around and contributing so much. Tell us a little bit about how you felt and how you set it up and uh, what made you actually engage in and giving back so much as you do. Oh man, you're giving me a lot of credit here that I'm not 100% sure that I deserve, Peter. <laughs> um, I you're think too modest. I, well, I, if you look at the facts, when I show up to um, things of the World Summit Awards, or it used to be European Youth Awards, what I see are people who have been engaged in giving back for two decades. You know, uh, what I see are people who um, will plan their annual holiday schedule around which awards there are, which events there are, and that's what inspires. I, I think I've, I've probably plugged in on maybe four or five events in the last couple of years, but um, it's so inspiring to see people in the community that are giving back uh, even more. And if I can do a small portion of that, then uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm honored to do so. I think um, as an entrepreneur, you gain so much inspiration from other entrepreneurs. Um, from seeing people that are at different parts in their journey. When you see people that are brand new at creating a startup, you get that initial vision, that initial energy, and it reminds you where you came from, how you started. When you see people that are a little later on that have developed sort of the cynicism of being knocked down by the market, it reminds you that, yeah, this is a pretty tough journey. Um, and, uh, and no matter how far you go, you can still be humbled by the market. And so I think as soon as you connect with other entrepreneurs that are at those different levels, you can take different levels of inspiration from them. So I, I guess that's what attracts me to keep uh, being part of the network is uh, this constant re-inspiration by seeing people at different stages in their journey and trying to learn as much as I can. I feel like I get more out of it than I put in by a wide margin. So yeah, it's an easy choice for me. Uh, that's very kind of you to say, but uh, let's look at the dark moments uh, when Gov Faces, uh, which was your winning project at that time, did not scale uh, when you were, I think you were in Portsmouth, is that correct? And uh, some other uh, places in England, and then you tried to connect in Geneva with the United Nations and uh, with some other uh, organizations. How did uh, how did you how how did you take the courage to talk to other people about that it's not going so well and then you apparently learned that uh, client first is uh, not just something you know which you think at the very end of a project but you have to think about it all the time from the very start and then uh, that you approached and this uh, concept of a lean startup. Tell us a little bit about that journey and the interactions you had in the network on that. Yeah, sure. Well, I think this network is relentlessly positive. Uh, that's one thing you can't you can't ding this network for not being positive, because when we presented with GovFaces, 
yeah, just about everybody at that festival said, boy, you guys are going to change the way political communication works. You guys are the next Mark Zuckerbergs, which back then used to be a compliment. Um, and, you know, it, people were just fluffing us up. This ego was just ah, massive. We had very few people that were saying, um, I have failed. Let me let me teach you something from my failure. That that type of advice is pretty rare um, to get as an entrepreneur. Instead, you you tend to value a little bit more, like oh, this guy just closed a, a twenty million pound uh, investment deal, or or uh, you know this girl that's running this business is is getting twenty k a month in revenue, and they're only six months old. Like those are the people you tend to listen to because you want to model after success. And um, when I think about the darkest moments with gov faces, I think that those are where the best lessons came from. Um, about how to how to quit, how to know when to call it a day with your startup, and how to how to say this is impacting my personal life in this way. We're going to step away. That is tough, uh, and you don't you don't learn it until you've been there. And I think now you know these. So I stepped away uh, about five years ago, a little over five years ago, and I've been a startup advisor for these last five years. And I think I can always point to the successes with GovFaces. We were in 23 countries. We had 100 plus people working with us around all these countries. And we had one third of the European Parliament using us. And oh, wow, these sound great. But the advice that I give is more effective when I talk about how to wrap up contracts, um, how to decide to cut and run from a new, uh, from a new office, um, and, and fundamentally how to test that your idea is going to be successful before you go ahead and waste four years of your life. Um, that is really valuable advice for startups to get. So yeah, I love talking about uh, startup failure just because it's very rare to get that kind of advice. I knew it was when I was a startup, so now I try and give it as much as I can. I think it's uh, something very, very much, uh, I mean, deep uh, for everybody how to stop lying to others, especially also stop lying to yourself about what you do and how your vision and uh, how your aspiration and how your um, motivation is larger than what you have. But what you have is not going to go that way unless you cut it, prune it, and then start somewhere else and to do so in an open and responsible manner. I mean, the openness, you know, to take the courage to talk about it. Sure. In a, let's say realistic fashion, not just to I mean, make yourself the hero of failure again, but to talk about uh, the learning from it. Yeah. Well, actually, do that? Uh, well, I know you probably want to go to the other panelists who have uh, pretty good perspectives on this too, I'm sure. But I would even say it's not deciding to be honest or deciding to stop lying. It's realizing that you might be lying or realizing that your vision might not be realistic or realizing that the two years that you've spent building this tech product, uh, maybe we didn't spend it in the right way. And those realizations are really tough to actually internalize. So it's less about... Um, well, at least for us, uh, we always felt like we were honest when we were pitching what we were doing and when we were explaining our vision. But then coming to realize, ooh, this may this thing may have been flawed from the beginning. That 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 is what was what was really the tough part. I was fortunate enough to have people in my life, my personal life, uh, my professional life, um, that were mentoring me on that. And I realized it at a certain point. Some of our tech guys had already realized it a year and a half prior. <laughs> Um, and some of the guys that stayed, like my colleague John Mark, uh, went and did brilliant sales with it. Uh, he brought it to a great level after I left, and uh, and that was uh, the things that he did in Geneva were were very smart. But you always reach a certain point where you realize there are some fundamental flaws here that are going to prohibit this from scaling, and then you just got to move on. When I look at be my eyes and what uh, Kristen, what you told us before, uh, your travel has been also. Uh, quite challenging though uh, of the six years three years uh, everybody saying okay what's your business model what's your business model what's your business model how are you gonna do it and yeah, <laughs> keeping keeping people on board keep, keep, keeping people engaged and I mean you, you were doing something you know, where your credibility especially with the volunteer community, all around, you know, I mean, the various different kind of countries. You said before that you are in 150 countries, which I find absolutely stunning and amazing. You know, 
how did you do that to I mean keep people on the one hand realistic, but also you know I mean having to let's say disappoint the expectation that you would have a quick monetization? How did you deal with that, Christian? Before answering that, Peter, I have a comment to what was mentioned before. Yeah, please. In terms of these uh, events like this. When I participated with my, with my first company at a uh, regional championship, I was competing with the 20 best companies in uh, Denmark. <clears throat> and um, and it was, I walked around asking for business cards from my competitors because I thought, wow, we should meet in six months time and just have a dinner and, con and a conversation around what they've learned. Turned out that some of the guys have already been doing that and they had an alumni organization. And alumni is very big in the US and it's getting bigger in Europe. And basically that's an organization of people who have walked the walk and and wants to tell others what to avoid. And so I must say that some of my best advice and also my best friends has turned out to be from events like this where I connect with someone who's like-minded they share, they share their failures. They share their deepest fear for the company, and and in doing that, we we get on the same page and grow uh, as people and as the future entrepreneurs that we are. So my warmest recommendation to always stay curious and jump into any kind of engagement that that is available, um, because you never know what kind of future job synergy that will come by by getting to know these people and and there was another um, point being made about learning from others um, early on we were introduced to a to a to a thought distinguishing between best practice and best principles and if you look at best practice that is copying one to one what the other company or person is doing but if you look at best principle you're really trying to open up and say, what is the principle behind principle behind whatever they're doing, and can I use some of that principle uh, in my company? So if you are at a restaurant and they give you a balloon at the end of the day, you, best practice would be to your restaurant also giving balloons, but the best principle would be to say, okay, they're extending the joy of being here for the kids or uh, grown-ups who wants a balloon, but they're really creating a memorabilia for you to remember the journey. They're creating even the excitement of going into the restaurant because the kids know that they will get a balloon. So early on, we were introduced to best principles and I have been stealing best principles since day one. And of course, you sh that is what we are good at. Like I think in particularly European um, entrepreneurs must be good at this because we will be overrun by the best mathematicians and developers in the world. They're, they're coming out of other regions uh, now. So we need to be good at conceptualizing. And in order to do that, um, best principle has been a guiding North Star for me. So in, to answer your question about monetization, um, one principle behind WhatsApp and why WhatsApp is a success is because they had written a poster in the early days at their office saying, three simple guidelines. No ads, no games, and no bullshit. Sorry for my French. Um, but if you think of that simple guideline, no ads, no games, no BS, there were many other telco providers, IP telephony providers out there, but they won by getting to, to volume quickest. So they, they created the community quickest. Had we... Um, not taken that principle and applied it, we would have added subscriptions. We would have, we might have added some um, marketing or advertising or commercials that would be spamming our users. But that would be dropping the ball completely and selling out to the community. They, they, we would be monetizing on the good deed of someone else and we would be for all the wrong reasons. And I think if you double click on what happens if you put a price to it, to it is also the fact that it will open up for competition. So if you go back to see our growth numbers, within the first 24 hours, we had 10,000 volunteers and 1,000 blind users. And in six weeks, we are in 100 countries. Like that's unheard of for a startup of our, of our size at that point to be born global, so to speak. Had we put a price to it, then any other tech company, major tech company would have come in 
dropped the price, made it cheaper, given them more hours, more data, whatever, and we would have a red ocean instead of the complete blue ocean that we find ourselves in today. <clears throat> so for me, it has been as much as an active deci decision to walk towards business models that were working for us as it has been protecting us from the business models that would have taken us in the wrong direction. Yeah. Being where we are today with, with uh, Microsoft and Google and these other major brands on board, it's not easy to get them. But coming to them and saying, we have a value offering that is higher than the price you pay for and, and will enable them to do something that they couldn't have done otherwise is, is really coming back to that mentality of everybody wins only when nobody loses. Like I was, I was living in the U.S. at that in the beginning of Be My Eyes because we were getting attention from the American markets, and we were called cute and cuddly by many of these advisors. Like they were thinking, "Yeah, you're a good social startup. You're definitely affected by the Scandinavian model, but you will never turn this into a business." And and they might have been wrong. It might have been right at that point with what they knew, but we had a strong belief that we would find a better business model. And I believe, uh, and we as a team believe that the future of business models are gonna be more ecosystem oriented. Um, and Peter, if I may double click for, on that for a second. The, I think the, the I remember seeing a tweet uh, once saying that future genera uh, previous generation measures success on materialistic status. So if you had a lot of houses and a lot of cars, you were successful. This generation is measuring success on the level of inner peace. And if that statement is true, then we have a paradigm shift in what the playing field for business model looks like. We cannot compete at the same uh, terms as we did 10, 15 years ago, because consumers are hungry and eager to be part of systematic solutions rather than be part of problems and consumption problems. We don't want, we know that it was us that got us to rising waters and higher temperatures. So whoever can enable us to be part of a bigger solution and also give us what we need, whether it's banking, a new pair of jeans or um, a beverage company, they will be the ones taking down the giants. So I really think that we need to, to consider what kind of business models are we building. And of course, it takes time. And that's why uh, Connor mentioning lean uh, startup in the beginning, it's, it's more important than ever. We have to build what the users want. And if we build that based on what we knew when that book was written, we're gonna end up the wrong place. And that's why the book needs to be reread, interpreted by those who will build the future business models so we can get out and have, I think we're gonna see more movement. We're gonna see major groups, communities grow, explode overnight to be part of global movements, like see Greta Thunberg and how she's, he's, she's, she's, she's getting so much support behind her. If she had a way for me to put in some money and get whatever product or service I already was subscribing to, but, su but su in supporting her case while doing it, I mean, her business would be through the roof. Thank you, uh, Christine. Uh, there's a lot of things which you uh, mentioned. You know, I, when I look at uh, Greta Thunberg, I always feel what is the burden of this enormous global visibility a single person has to bear? And is it fair for us all to lean on her? And uh, how can we actually I mean, find a way in which technology I mean, assists that the burden is not on a person, but it's on a network and it's on a whole, I mean, community like, for instance, uh, WSA. And one of the things which you mentioned before in terms of how you connect in friendships and the alumni organization, I think that one of the critical principles also of the European Youth Award has been, and also of the Young Innovators Festival and the World Summit Award is, that's an open community. It's not a closed community. It's not, a, let's say, a platoon of uh, friends who met once and then they look inward and inward and inward. That's uh, something which I wanted to ask uh, Matthias, actually. You are one of those who have been always moving in and out and uh, how to keep it open. How, how, how does the community here 
work for you? And uh, how, how can you say to others who are now sharing in this session how they can use it uh, for themselves? What would your recommendations or your insights be? What is this? Um, from the very beginning, I said I, the first price was 2009 and then 2012 in Graz again. I think one of the key moments was meeting not just other entrepreneurs, but really friends, which I carried till now, which I'm not just chatting here and then, but really collaborating on new projects. If I think of winners like Abbas and Kari and also Tudor and so on, we have many, many follow up projects which came out of the first meeting at the festival. Um, spending a couple of days together, um, showcasing our solutions, get, giving tips to each other. But then a very crucial point, and for me that was the, the, the key moment, to have a follow-up which is not just like, hey, how are you, what's what you're doing, but it's, hey, how can we use our expertise as we have to support each other in what we're doing right now? And when I looking back, especially with Kari Winner 2009, we, we founded the Digital Participation Camp where we invited a lot of winners each year to give them room to just collaborate. And I think collaboration is here, that, that keyword as such. A lot of these solutions have a lot of innovative ideas and technical power and know-how to support the other projects. And not just as a best practice, but as a best principle, obviously. So um, the, the, a lot of also the, the tools which were used for one thing could have had a major impact for the project in another country on a completely different topic. And um, along this way, um, we, we did not just collaborate and gain friends, but we also helped them to show their ideas to the world. I mean, I had the platform with it, with TEDx. A lot of the winners of the um, of the festival were speaking at the TEDx stage, and again, enabling them to reach out to an even, even bigger crowd. You know, Connor, your partner, Tudor, spoke about GAF faces, but not so much about the platform, but about the idea of political communication as such. And it was one of the most powerful talks we had in all these years with a huge reach out. So it's the, even if the platform is not there, the idea of what it stands for and the idea behind it is much bigger than the platform itself. So it, it's incredible how much um, waves this had also after. And the, the suggestion from my side is for sure looking closely to the, who the people are here and the complete opposite what we learn maybe in networking to see which value can you bring to the to the other people who are on the table and on in, in this chat, to let, let's say so. So what can I do to make your uh, idea and your project better with my capacity and with me volunteering an hour, whatever, to, to, to give you everything I have from learning how to fail, but also how to how to trick the Facebook algorithm. So whatever is in my capacity. And especially this thought of how can I also contribute to somebody else um, brought me to back to where I am now, to have a huge network, which is not a network. Because one more thing about the thought networking, I, I hate networking. I hate the word networking, because it seems like always you go in with a, with a pre-written agenda and something you want to, you want to gain something for yourself out, out of it. But what I love is to go to these festivals and to deeply connect with a few people instead of exchanging 100 business cards, to have deep talks with the people of things we care about and connect on a much deeper level. And eventually this will come out to something great. Maybe not, then you have even a, a great friend you can talk to, but in many cases it turned out that we can collaborate and do something great and achieve something great on top. And this is not networking, this is building friends, building meaningful connections, and then build upon with collaboration. And I think this was have, has been one of the most important and most wonderful prizes of the, of the festival I have gained. Uh, thank you, Matthias. Um, it's Connect for Impact. That's uh, what we um, have on the website, uh, Connect for Impact. That's what we have also as uh, you know the motto but it's also something you know where what you're saying is really connect for impact one has to focus and uh, limit oneself in order to sustain something uh, christian you're sitting in front of a bookshelf is that uh, do i see this correct in the in your back yes i can yes. And where and where is this book on uh, on pre prototyping which you were talking about before can you just hold this up? Uh, I mean, uh, you you made us also interested in uh, in a 
So I, I thought that you would not only have Mr. Shirky and Lean Startup there, but also that book. You see, you see a third of the bookshelf, and I uh, can walk over here and find uh, uh, find it. But I I, uh, I shared it in the chat already uh, when I read oh, it. You did. Okay, very good. Okay, so I, I didn't see it, so I, it's very good. Thank you for doing that. We are having another 20 minutes, 25 minutes, uh, and I wanted to come to uh, the last, uh, let's say, area of, of conversation. Uh, you have talked about this already, uh, Tiana, about uh, how you have also, and uh, everybody knows that key to being a social entrepreneur is not to fall into this kind of trap that business model means right away quick monetization of something, you know, according to the Silicon Valley model, you know, I mean, having, you know, I mean, 100 million users and then uh, go to the stock market and uh, rake in billions. If you look at, uh, at your own journey and uh, tell us a little bit about and take us through this twists and turns of uh, looking at what we call business model, which is basically the model by which we can uh, get enough resources to continue on the journey of learning how to adapt our application, our solution to the needs and to the environment in which we move. Tell us a little bit about your journey on that. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, for us, money is just a tool, so it is not a goal. So definitely impact is our goal, and I think it is the same for everyone who, who tried to improve society in any way, in social and environmental or, or any kind uh, of improvement. So definitely we consider money as, uh, as a tool that helps us to plant trees and to, to gain our goals. Uh, yes, we changed uh, business models several times. So first we started with the idea that someone will pay us to make assessment, to use satellite images and to make assessment where to plant trees. But unfortunately, uh, we, we concluded that there is no, um, I would say, uh, customers or um, local governments that want to do something like that. So they have some projects and they already made some plan uh, how to plant trees. Then we try to implement our solution in agriculture. And we thought that maybe farmers will be ready to, to pay us to do some spatial analysis uh, to, to, to reduce uh, usage of fertilizers, nutrition, etc. So that was the second business model. And the third one, we came back to forest because then we realized, okay, then we will do agriculture, but we want to plant trees. So let, let's plant trees. And then we realized that maybe uh, th th that idea about team building activities would be the perfect. So th that idea will let us to plant trees and to use our knowledge. But unfortunately, in our case, COVID just started after we completed that business model. So I think, and definitely this moment is not the perfect moment to organize team building activities. But in the future, maybe we will change again business model, or maybe we will try to, to implement this business model. But anyway, we, we got again the, 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 the support of uh, Ministry of uh, Environmental Protection. So at least in this year, we plant some trees, which is, um, in, in some way, which is our goal. So definitely we do something that we want to do. Um, yes, so that is how we always change the, 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 the core idea and we, we try, okay, the, the, the main goal is the same, try to, to combat climate change, try to plant as much tree as you, trees as, as you can. But definitely uh, we are not afraid to change our business model. And definitely probably in the future we will do that again. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tiana, for, for this. Uh, I think uh, it's this kind of determination to carry on and to not lose sight of what you do and uh, where you want to go and to be uh, purpose-driven. 
This is uh, the notion which is also so critical and central to what the World Summit Award and the European Young Innovators Festival is all about, is to be so purpose-driven. And uh, to follow through on this, then you stay flexible, or as Connor said before, lean, or uh, as um, uh, Christian said, uh, using uh, the WhatsApp uh, reference, you know, no ads, no games, no bullshit. You know, that is something very, very, that very much also what uh, the World Summit Award is uh, and the Young Innovators Festival is all about. I just saw that uh, we have a great pleasure to welcome now uh, Sana Havaski uh, in, uh, in our uh, uh, session. Uh, Sana, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you well. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but I don't see that you are on air now. Can we just uh, have uh, from the technical people put Sana on air as well, please? Uh, I, I just see that uh, we need to uh, switch, uh, maybe. Sana, how are you doing? I'm fine. Sorry for joining late. It's some yeah. logistic issues that we're uh, facing right now in Syria. Uh, tell us where you are in Syria. I'm in the capital, capital of Damascus. Damascus. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm. I I don't know. I am hearing my voice. I don't know why. Okay. You're fine. You can go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I'm based now in Syria, uh, in Damascus. Um, I'm late because some issues of the electricity. I'm sorry for joining late. It's something that is somehow general in the country right now, unfortunately. So um, yeah, uh, I'm still working on Datity, a winning uh, project that won uh, the European Youth Award in 2017 and also had the recognition of uh, WSA in 2019 um, with the Arabic content. Um, so yeah. Um, That's great that you can join us. Uh, that is wonderful. Uh, it's hard to imagine uh, sitting, you know, in Denmark or uh, sitting, you know, even uh, in Austria, I guess, uh, from Serbia and, uh, and other parts of Europe as well, uh, the conditions under which you have to work. Uh, tell us, what does your work include at the moment and what do you are operating on and how have you taken your winning project into a new stage? Just tell us a little bit about this. Please go ahead. Yeah, actually, the uh, winning the prizes was um, a great push for um, uh, our journey. Uh, we worked harder to um, achieve more um, partnerships and uh, work on schools and to, to get into new milestones. So one of the greatest achievement that we could done was working with one of the UN agencies in Syria to teach um, 200 uh, children to work on electricity electronics and uh, programming and that was achievement for us and uh, it uh, led us to new achievements on both the personal the academic and the professional aspects so um, uh, the the sessions and the uh, mindset that I learned uh, in uh, both EA and WSA uh, really moved me to help other youth uh, in Syria to uh, learn how to design um, purpose-driven uh, purpose solutions uh, that really are uh, designed very well in order to cope with the, the users. So uh, I worked um, on more than 400 hours of training and uh, um, more than um, 100 hours of consultations with young entrepreneurs. So uh, I felt that it um, gave me like a recognition or um, a credit that uh, I'm able to help and I have the mindset to, to share with uh, my colleagues and friends. Tell, tell us a little bit about the, your application because uh, not everybody who is in the session now, there's yeah. over uh, 80 people now in the session and they're all interested in saying, 
oh, what did Sana actually do? <laughs> what was the original <laughs> idea? And uh, what did you implement? And how did you get then also to where you are today? So tell us a little bit about that you had an e-learning application, but it is not just an application. It is a whole set. And uh, it's something, you know, which uh, where people, especially young women, learn about electronics. Tell us a little bit. Yeah, so Darati uh, works on developing multiple products. One of them is the Darity Toolkit, which is um, a toolkit helps children to learn electronics uh, in an interactive way. So uh, we have that um, th this board uh, that we can um, uh, um, assemble over it some electronic uh, components in order to build circuits and inventions. So we worked with a lot of kids in Syria and uh, now we are working on relocating to another point in the Middle East in order to uh, scale up our business. And at the same time, with uh, due to COVID-19 updates, uh, we had to work on online versions of uh, this type of content. So we worked more on uh, doing things about like uh, full programs and courses uh, in order to um, help young people uh, how to um, get this design mindset and to work uh, on entrepreneurship uh, from uh, a very young age and of course also to uh, build these technical skills that will enable them to do or design any idea that they have to solve or um, any issue they, they face in their lives. Thank you, uh, uh, Sana, for this. Uh, last question on, on this is, is, are you in touch with a lot of people from uh, World Summit Award now? And uh, how is the community able to interlink with you and even work with you? Or, or as uh, Matthias said before, don't network, but collaborate? Actually, I admire the uh, networking um, style of uh, those two competitions, especially uh, while I am uh, um, uh, have the option to mentor some startups or to work with them on um, advancing their projects or how to, um, to, to work or how to pitch their uh, startups in the competition. So working with the fresh new startups and also connecting with some industry leaders that I've met on the um, conferences and sessions was really helpful. And uh, until now, I'm still in contact with some of them that were really where we're with alignment with the interests and uh, uh, let me say values or missions. So um, at the same time, uh, I, I feel really proud when I uh, nominate some of the uh, Syrian startups or to uh, um, encourage the, the people in Syria to join such international competition uh, in order to um, get involved in uh, that uh, vibrant community and uh, um, special learning experience. Yes, it's very important for us as well to be connected with you because uh, especially the dire situation in which your country and also uh, the city in which you live is at the moment, it is quite exceptional and therefore it's a great uh, thing that you can be in touch with us. Uh, Connor, you are uh, now in Uganda. Uh, what is your what is your basic connection regarding uh, uh, the WSA and uh, and interlinking and uh, just tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, well, we are applying to the WSA this year. Um, we are an applicant because we're quite new still. Uh, we started about two. Uh, what is it? Two years ago. Um, so yeah, we are an applicant for the WSA say this year. Um, with GovFaces, of course, my previous startup, we won the European Youth Award back when that was a thing in 2014. Um, and now we're hoping that SEMA as an organization can also plug into this network. Um, in fact, we've identified it as one of our biggest needs. Uh, I don't want to sound like I'm pitching for the award here. <laughs> I'm, I'm at risk of doing that. But um, what we look forward to, what we, uh, because I know that I will always be a member of this network as a as a person, um, and we'll be able to draw on it from that. But as SEMA, as an organization, we're at a point where we've proven what we need to prove here in Uganda, um, which is that our system works, 
and we can get uh, the public sector to pay for it. Um, a very interesting. I just I love the um, the conversation about money as a tool or a goal um, that came up earlier. For us, it's validation. It's not the end goal, um, and of course, it's a tool. I agree with that. But for us, it's validation. So we've received the validation now that the public sector will pay for this improvement to public services. So now our challenge is scale, um, and that's where we really hope to. Um, yeah, to sort of plug in. In my experience with GovFaces, that's one of the biggest benefits of this network is that no matter where we went across Europe and even around the world, we would always find people uh, within the WSA network and within the um, European Youth Award network that we could call on, that we could ask for advice about where to move to next, how to scale, or could make some connections in a new country for us. So yeah, that's how we hope to be uh, plugging in with it with SEMA. Thank you very much. We have to wrap up now in the next uh, couple of minutes. Uh, Christian, did you find your books? Uh, show us uh, so that everybody sees what the cover is. Please go ahead. So one other book I'd like to recommend, and I put it in the uh, chat as well, is called Reboot, which is basically um, Jason Stockwood, who's a uh, an advisor and now an investor in Be My Eyes. He wrote a book about that whole paradigm shift of how we need to change. Uh, of course, Connor, the Bible is there. Um, and then I think Matthias is very, very familiar with uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, and I would encourage everybody to read his books, uh, but do it in the order. Start out by not necessarily uh, crushing it, which was the first, but the thank you economy. The thank you economy is also a pillar uh, in why we have built our company like we have and uh, and and will be for many um, uh, for, for any future adventure adventure of mine. And I must say, I'm not a big uh, I was not a big reader until I took myself uh, forced myself to read for 30 minutes per day at night before going to sleep. And now it's a habit. I can't fall asleep. Although having uh, three small kids, you would think I could just fall over, but I have to read something, and uh, it's a great pleasure. You never know where those dots will connect in the future. Sana, thank you for uh, joining and for the incredible and important job you're doing. Uh, that is uh, an inspiration to uh, us uh, in particular. Thank you, Christian, for being so kind and sharing this. Um, Sana will be connected for the uh, next uh, couple of days, three days. Uh, Matthias, are you giving a workshop again uh, at this uh, year's uh, Young Innovators Festival, as you usually do? Um, I did already for for, for the pitches, um, but that was my involvement already. So you will tell everybody in March there's the World Summit Award Global event, and then you will give a workshop again, yes? Exactly. <laughs> okay, then I say thank you all for this really very, very thoughtful and reflective session. Sana, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, Tiana, thank you. Connor, all the best to Uganda. Christian, keep rolling. And Sana, the last word is to you because you joined the last and therefore you will have the last word. Sana, please close thank this you. session. Yeah, so maybe it always needs for the new startups to concentrate more on the need and to concentrate on the user and uh, and then um, the passion or the, the uh, ability to work on any idea will happen automatically once the the uh, the team which means that we have to choose a great team also are all um, able to to understand the the uh, real need for for any startup then the work will happen uh, with no effort so f firstly find your a uh, dedicated team and then search for the, uh, the the most urgent need that you can help and then work will happen happily. <laughs>